How's everyone doing? Good, good. My name's Nathan. I'm one of the pastors here. Um, I saw some new uh, faces. If you would, in that seat back pocket, there's a care card. Uh, it'd be a huge favor to us if you would fill that out. Uh, maybe you want to serve. Uh, maybe you just need to talk to someone. Um, it'd be our honor uh, to walk through life with you. So go ahead and, and fill that out. Um, for those of you who are new, uh, we've been going verse by verse through the book of Mark for over a year now. Um, we're coming now to one of the uh, really darkest chapters, uh, darkest scriptures, um, but it's one that should give us uh, crazy hope um, because of what Jesus uh, did for us. And so if you'll remember last week, he, he instituted the Lord's Supper. He literally transformed the Passover that had been observed for 1,500 years into his Lord's table for us to communion with the saints. And it was incredible. He, he told Judas he was going to betray him. He told the disciples they would all leave him. And Peter emphatically denied it. He gives Peter excruciatingly accurate detail of exactly how he is going to do it. And now he's, they've left the upper room. They're, they've gone to the Mount of Olives, and, and they're going to a garden uh, that Jesus uh, frequently uh, went to. And so our text today is going to be verses 32 through 52 of Mark chapter 14. And verse 32 starts like this. And they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. Uh, now this garden, most theologians and church fathers believed it was owned by a very wealthy follower of Christ. Um, because we learn in, in John chapter 18 that Jesus retreated here often with his disciples. And, and the way uh, gardens worked back then, they had, a, uh, they had a, a wall around them. There was a lot of uh, security and they didn't want people uh, coming in. But Jesus often went here. And so Judas naturally would have known where Jesus was going. And it's funny, uh, the, well, it's not funny, but it's interesting. The, the word Gethsemane is, is kind of uh, related uh, with tribulation. It means to press and so it's, it's ironic that it would, it would carry uh, that name. And so he takes all 11 with him, and he leaves the eight at the entrance. And then it says, and he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. Now, now here's the issue with the Greek versus the English. Uh, and you'll see many times I'll put the Greek word up. And here's the reason why. Greek to me, and I'm, trust me, I am no... Uh, Greek uh, scholar by any stretch of the means. I've got a software package that helps me out a lot um, that makes me seem a lot smarter than what I really am. But anyway, um, the Greek is almost like a fourth dimensional language. And it carries with it a lot of, within one word, a lot of meaning. And you got to remember, Peter, James, and John were the ones that caught a glimpse of his glory. Remember we unpacked Transfiguration? And Jesus was transfigured before them. And they got, to, they got a sneak peek at the glory of when the Son of Man returns and the glory of his Father and the angels. And he's going to set up this new kingdom and he's going to, he's going to roll it up. Amen. And so, but now they saw that glory. Now they're going to get to see Jesus in his most agonizing moment. Uh, his harshest and hardest temptation he ever had in the garden of Gethsemane. And this, this uh, situation here teaches the apostles and consequently us just how frail we are in our sin nature and how we are capable of doing heinous, terrible, treacherous things if we do not continuously and constantly abide and how to do it. And so this first word, distressed, it means to be very alarmed, perplexed, and amazed Jesus was amazed at the terror he was experiencing right then and there. He was amazed. He was perplexed. He could not believe the terror he was experiencing. And then if you look at the word troubled, to be greatly distressed, to be in extreme anxiety and anguish. And so almost a, a more descriptive analogy would be he began to be terrified and disoriented. And you got to remember and I cannot wait till we, we get into our series, the Christmas series, where we're talking about the word becoming flesh and what Christmas is about is, is incarnate, where God came down to earth. I remember Jesus was clearly 100% God. 
if you don't believe that, you don't understand the scriptures of God. But he was also 100% man. He felt like we felt. He bled like we bled. He would have gotten sick like we would get sick. He was tempted and tried in every way. And here's the thing. He knew. He had told his disciples uh, that, that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suffer. He said it multiple, multiple times. But terror strikes his soul because it's, it's literally coming upon him. And the intensity of his pain was so great, he could, he could barely even move. And that's why he says in verse 34, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. Now, you're going to see this theme throughout this message. And this is the exact same Greek word that Jesus used in his Olivet Discourse, where he talked to the apostles about the end times. And remember, we learned in chapter 13, the, uh, the object of Jesus teaching that was not to figure out how or when he's going to come back, is to remain vigilant is to constantly take a self-analysis of ourselves and are we ready for the return of our great king? Are you? Are you ready? Because this scripture is gonna help be a, a crazy good litmus test for if you truly are, if you're a child of God or if you're a child of wrath, we're gonna find out. And so when he says even to death, Jesus is almost already incapacitated right here. He is barely able to put one foot in front of the other. He's just starting to fully realize in his human faculties that he is going to die alone, that he is going to become the sin of the world, that his father is going to have to leave him, and that all his closest friends will abandon him. Abandon him. And, and we learned from Luke's account that he sweat drops of blood. He was so overcome with anxiety and torment that he had a condition called hematridosis, which is a medical condition. Uh, that happens very rarely, but it happens when someone is under extreme mental and emotional anxiety. Uh, their, uh, their capillaries next to their sweat glands can burst and they can literally sweat drops of blood. And he asks his friends to watch. And then he, he leaves and we learn from Luke's account, he goes about a stone's throw from him. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Now, I have, I've purposely left the latter half of verse 36 off of here. We'll get to that in just a moment. But Jesus falls on the ground. That, uh, that Greek word, he, just, he basically collapsed. Imagine Jesus with his face buried in the dirt with the sweat and the blood, and he's sitting there crying out to his Abba, Father. You can read in Matthew 18 where Jesus talks about if you're not like this child, you can't, hear, you can't inherit the kingdom. You must have humility like a little child. Jesus is living it out. Jesus always lived out his teaching, folks. He always walked the walk. He never just talked the talk. He always walked the walk and led by example as an example for you and for me. If anyone would, let him deny himself, pick up his cross and follow me. Do what I do, do it how I did it, with my attitude. But this, this word Abba here, it's an Aramaic term. That's a term of endearment. And it's, it's what we would call like, like a papa or daddy. It was an endearing term. And this would have been unheard of in the Jewish world to have called the God of the universe daddy. And here's the part that stinks. And I can't really empathize with this situation. But there are many in this room that had a horrible example of an earthly father. There are many people in here who, when I say God is a good father, you cannot relate to that because your earthly father has let you down. And to that, all I can say is fill out a care card and let us help you process that because our God is a good, good, loving father that you can't even begin to imagine the love that he desires to lavish you with until you allow him to. And I hate it for people because I talk to people all the time. I've got a good dad who I know always loved me, who still loves me to this day. So if you've got a, if you've got a situation there where you struggle with that, man, let us help. We've, helped, we've had countless people help process that. And now they're, they're truly seeing the God of the universe as the good, loving Abba Father that wants to lavish them with love. Just like Ephesians 2, 4 says, please let us help you navigate that. But Jesus is 
He is overcome with agony and astonishment. It is beyond, it's beyond all of this. And it's, we got to understand what, what, what is this? Why is he doing this? Because for the first time, he is truly realizing the fullness of his terror, his, his disorientation, his anxiety is so severe that he is reaching total incapacitation. That experience at the garden is pressing in on him to the point he is, he's bleeding. And here's the thing. <laughs> if Jesus succumbs now and he says, I don't want to do this anymore, his mission has failed. God's word is void. The gospel's meaningless. Heaven will be empty and Satan will win, will win if Jesus does not press on. This is the moment where he has to decide, am I going to culminate my mission and take on the sin of the world and all the sins that Nathan did yesterday, all the sins that Nathan did two months ago, two years ago, 20 years ago, 20 years from now are gonna be heaped on me. By the way, yours as well. All the dumb stuff we did yesterday all the bitterness, the unforgiveness, the lust, the envy, the greed. Everything from every person in here is getting ready to get heaped on top of him. And he is going to become that. And his father's going to have to turn his back on him so that he can pour out all his wrath on him. Jesus knows it's coming. And he knows he's going to be completely alone in the midst of it. Thank God some of the hardest times in mine and Kelly's lives, we had people constantly checking in on us, praying for us when we were going through open heart surgeries or, or other things with our kiddos. We had so much support and love. I can't imagine us having to do that. I can't imagine my wife wasn't with me during all that and having to do that all alone. And here's the thing, he's taking on the sins of the world. The only, there's only one way he can do this is to literally fall back into the will of the Father. Everything is, has been stripped from him. Everything. And then he says, here's the part. <laughs> and he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet, not what I will, but what you will. Wow. This statement characterized Jesus' entire life. He did a lot of things. He did a lot of things that didn't make sense. A lot of things. Every possible layer of support and encouragement is being removed from the God of the universe except the unshakable desire to do the will of his father. There's only one thing Jesus did. What was it? That's it. That's all he did. He makes it clear in John's gospel so many times, but in John 6, for I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. What should be our goal in life? If we're going to follow Jesus, and the only thing Jesus did was the Father's will, what should be all of our respective goals? To do the will of the Father. What is God's will for your life? What is it? Jesus had asked his disciples to, to stay and listen. He comes back, and imagine what he would have looked like. I mean, mud and, and dirt and tears and, and blood. He could barely walk. And he comes back, and he sees Peter, James, and John, the ones that saw him in the transfiguration. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? That implies Jesus did for the whole hour. And remember Peter emphatically stating, I will die with you. And he can't even stay awake and, and pray with him. Uh, Luke adds that when they heard this, they were in deep, deep sorrow. But Jesus has been on his face, crying out and abiding with his father for an hour. And then out of that hour's worth of experience, he gives some crazy good advice for us to take. He says, watch and pray. That same Greek word, there it is. Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit, he's talking about our human spirit, not the Holy Spirit, it's not a capital S. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. Folks, we got three enemies in this world. Our flesh, the world, and the enemy. Stop being a cop-out and blaming the enemy for all your problems. The majority of our problems are our own sinful flesh. That is the majority of our problem. The vast majority. And then we see the world doing it, and all the enemy's got to do is agree with us. That's all he's got to do. Don't, don't, don't be easy on yourself. 
I've heard leaders say, well, man, the reason we're having this, we're being attacked by Satan. No, maybe it's because you're not in the middle of God's will. And he's curving you back to it. And I'm just like, again, this watch is a common theme throughout Scripture. It's a self-analysis. It is looking in the mirror. And this would have been so encouraging to Mark's audience. Remember, Mark is writing to the church in Rome while Nero is in power who was getting a shortage of wood because he was crucifying so many Christians. And he wanted to leave them up there and hang there for a while to prove a point. That's who Mark is writing to. This would have been so encouraging to them. And remember, the end of the Olivet Discourse, Jesus sums the whole chapter 13 up by saying this. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. It's that same Greek word, to be ready. Jesus in his infinite grace and mercy towards Peter, James, and John, and consequently us, is to use this horrible time as a time of teaching for us, for us to understand how Jesus acted. We are all going to go through our respective Gethsemanes. Every one of us will go through horrible valleys. I know there are people in here right now that are navigating horrible, horrible things right now. Jesus gives us the answer. He is spending time with the Father. And I'm just going to say it. My wife's like, I hate it when you say that. <laughs> What's getting ready to come out of his mouth? But here's the thing. If you're not living a life of dependent prayer, you're in sin. Wait till we read these scriptures I'm getting ready to read, and you tell me. It's a clear command from God to live a life in dependent prayer just like our Lord and Savior did in order to triumph over our unredeemed flesh. We still have unredeemed flesh inside of us, our sinful flesh and desires. Paul gives the answer to it when he's writing to the churches in Galatia. He says, but I say, walk by the Holy Spirit. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. How many of you feel like there's a war going on in your body where you want to do the things that you know you're supposed to do, but you don't do them. Well, I need to read my Bible more. I need to cuss less. I need to gossip less. I need to get rid of that bitterness or that unforgiveness. But you just can't shake it. And you're like, man, what is wrong with me? I got to be a better Christian. I want to be a good Christian. I'm just going to tell you, there's no such thing as one. There's not. There, there's just sinners redeemed by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's what there, are. That's what there is, Period. They're against the spirit, the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. If you want, this afternoon, read Romans 7. It seems like Paul's having some sort of a schizophrenic meltdown where he says, why well, do I do the things I hate? I don't do the things I love. I want to do the things I love, but I don't do the things I love. I do the things I hate. What a wretched man am I? And this is arguably the strongest follower of Jesus to ever walk the face of the planet. And he says these things. It's because Paul knows that this goes on all the time. Walk by the Spirit. Peter, 30 years after this Gethsemane experience when he's writing to us, the church in 1 Peter, it, these words must have been stuck in his mind forever. He says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Again, that vigilance. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. But Peter, James, and John had the best of intentions, but they fell asleep, didn't they? And then the next verse, and he went, and went again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. So he's going for a second time. I love what Matthew's account says about this. Matthew says, again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, my father. Listen, this is, in, this is, this is just amazing. This is the kind of bold prayers we need to have as a church. My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Wow. Wow. Folks, we've, you want to pray a bold prayer? Pray that. Pray that. There's no more bold prayer than this. What is, what is God calling you to do? Jesus never wanted to change God's plans. He's just asking if there's another way, let's do it that way. How do you know it's, I'm going to say this, and this might be a little offensive. How do you know it's not God's will for you to go through a significant, horrible period of suffering for his glory. Please don't say, well, God would never do that. Please don't. <laughs> then 
You're just, you're just not reading the God of Scripture. God wants you to be happy, really? God wants you to be holy. Big, big difference. And so he comes back to them, and he says, again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. These guys probably were like, oh, my goodness. Peter's probably like, James, John, man, we let him down again. He's got more blood on his face. Man, what's going on? And you got to remember, just a few minutes prior to this, they swore to follow him to death. Just a few minutes prior, a couple of hours. And again, they had great intentions. But unlike the disciples who were falling asleep, Jesus responded to each wave of temptation with intense periods of prolonged, intimate, and raw prayer with his Father. Folks, let that be a valuable lesson to us. A valuable lesson lesson. I love the way the writer of Hebrews explains this fact about Jesus. Listen to Hebrews 5, 7. In the days of his flesh, when God decided to come down here and be a human, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. That Greek word there is fear. Again, you know what the beginning of wisdom is? Proverbs is clear. Fear of the Lord. You have zero wisdom until you start having a healthy, reverent, awestruck fear of the God of the universe. And again, there's a big difference between deduction and discernment. Again, if I got a 20-gallon gas tank, gets 20 miles a gallon, I can deduce I can go 400 miles on a tank of gas. That's not discernment. Discernment comes from God. And until we humble ourselves and we have a reverent, awestruck fear of the Lord, God Almighty, you don't have wisdom. The scripture's clear on this. He says in the next verse, although he was a son, again, shocking, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who what? obey him. Not to all who attend church regularly, not to all who put some money in the plate, not to all who pray a prayer, not to all who say, well, my grandmom and granddaddy said this, so I'm good. No, to all who obey him. How do you know how to obey him? Get in his word. People ask me all the time, Nathan, what's God's will for my life? Open the Bible. Open it, study it, fall in love with it. And I'm, I'm, I'm so excited to jump into our incarnate series. We're going to unpack scriptures like Galatians 4 and Philippians 2 and, and John 1 to understand why we celebrate Christmas. By the way, you know there's not one directive in scripture for us to celebrate the birth of Christ, right? Churches make a big deal out of it. Not one directive. We're told constantly to remember his death and proclaim it constantly. So I'm just saying, folks, we got to get back to the scriptures. And in verse 41... And he came a third time and said to them, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The son of man is betrayed into the hands of those sitting at Hendersonville church. He was, he was betrayed into, into my hands. He was betrayed into your hands. He was betrayed into our hands. Like, please walk out of here and know that our sin was part of the nails that nailed him to that cross. Please understand that. It wasn't just the people who were there. It wasn't just the Roman soldiers, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, or the scribes. It was the sins of all of us that put him on that tree. You know, this, this is the third wave of temptation, and Jesus is resolute. The, the, the Greek here where he says this, it is 100%, it's done. Let's roll. Those of you who know me know I say that quite often. When, we, when I want to do something, shiny object, let's roll. I mean, that's, that's the way I am. I get it. Not perfect. I'm a sheep just like y'all, being sanctified. Y'all sheep too, right? Like, you get that. Okay, so we'll make sure. I ain't the only sheep in here. But listen, he's like, it's enough. The hour's come. Let's, let's go. And, and he, all three are in, it's crazy because Mark, it's like the Holy Spirit impressed on Mark there are three times Mark records a deep situation of prayer with Jesus. 
Uh, once in chapter 1 of Mark, once in chapter 6, and here. All three times he went to a place of solitude. All three times he was, he was dealing with a tough situation. It's almost like Mark saw these three situations as fundamental to understanding the person and work of Jesus Christ. Folks, I cannot tell you how important prayer is and abiding. You can't do this without doing it. And I'm just, I'm just going to read some scripture. And you tell me how important it is to God. Psalm 145. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. This right here, 66 books written by roughly 40 authors over 1,500 years across three continents. This is the only truth that is on our planet. I figured I'd get a whole bunch of amens right there. This is the only truth. It's not our constitution. It's not our bill of rights. I mean, I, I love those. I'm, I support our country. Romans 13 commands that. This is the only truth. What if, what if I had sitting up here, what if right here was the Wall Street Journal from 2030 with all the stock prices? What, what if it was? What, imagine that. What if it was the, uh, the Almanac or, or whatever from 2030 had all the winners of World Series and Super Bowls and the exact scores? I would get trampled and probably killed. And sitting right there is something infinitely more valuable. And how much dust is it gathering on yours at home? It's God's word to us. That's why he says, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful. There's that watchful self-analysis, a self-inventory with it in thanksgiving. I find myself all the time just calling God like a 911 line. God, please help this church. Uh, God, please uh, heal my wife. God, please heal my two uh, younger kids. God, please do this. God, please do that. When do I say, God, holy, holy, holy is your name. God, you, you are everything. God, I only have the words to describe your grace and mercy. Thank you, thank you, thank you, folks. We, we have got to understand. And again, is this a suggestion that Paul's given uh, the church in Colossae? Is this a suggestion? Hey, guys, if you don't mind, it'd be great. But if not, hey, I don't care. No, it's a, it's a command. When he's writing the church in Ephesus, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Do you pray for your brothers and sisters in Christ? Jesus even told a parable to the effect I love the way Jesus, the, the scriptures tie this together. I'll always to pray and not lose heart. How's your anxiety? Is it through the roof? How's your peace? How's your joy? Because that's what you get with Jesus. Notice I didn't say happiness. I didn't say comfort. I said joy and peace. And Jesus walked this out. Uh, the night he selected the 12 apostles. In these days, he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued. Just so you know, the Greek there is from sunset to sunup, roughly eight straight hours nonstop. Eight straight hours nonstop. He's, he's God. He's God. Eight straight hours nonstop, he continued in prayer to God. You know, it's, you read Genesis 3, there was a rebellion in the garden where sin and death entered the world. But in this garden, it was submission. It was humility. And what that did, it reversed that pattern. And it brought a means to us by which we can be saved and redeemed from sin. And without a fervent prayer life, Jesus would not have been able to do it. That's the way it was designed from eternity past to help us understand if you want peace and joy, spend time alone with your father. Where is your Gethsemane? Where is your retreat? Where do you get away from this thing? Now, trust me, I, I've got to be careful. I'm not a hypocrite. I got the same problem. Where's your retreat where you're away from everybody, but you are with the God of the universe and you sit in his presence and you talk to him and you let him lavish you with love like he earnestly desires to do in Christ Jesus. And then out of Jesus' resoluteness, he says this, rise, let us be going. 
See, my betrayer is at hand. Jesus' mind is set. His emotions are strong. His will is set. And he is ready to put one foot in front of the other to that cross, to become sin, to have his father pour out all his righteous, holy, and beautiful wrath onto his son that we all deserved. Jesus probably saw Judas coming with the mob, and here we go. And immediately, Mark loves this word. While he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the 12, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. By the way, these three groups didn't get along. Boy, they were sure united on their hatred for Jesus, weren't they? Like, we got to get rid of this guy. Uh, Matthew tells us it was a great crowd. Uh, and John tells us there were Roman soldiers present. Most theologians believe uh, there was a battalion of 600 Roman soldiers accompanying these guys, coming with, with all this force. How convenient it was for them, too. It was at night, no light around. It was outside the city. Because remember, the city would have been packed with people. It was outside the city because they want to do this under the stealth of night. And then listen what Judas does. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi. And he kissed him. Judas is directing this entire operation. And here's the part that's mind blowing. Imagine what Judas saw in those three years with Jesus. I mean, he saw things that would would put us in shock. I mean, he saw demons get cast out. He saw, he saw wind and waves obey him. He saw dead people rise. And look, look what he does because Jesus didn't give him what he wanted. As soon as he knew he wasn't going to get what he wanted from Jesus, he was out. Man, how often we do that. Well, God, I think I should get this promotion, or I, I think I should have this type of marriage, or God, I think I should have this, or, or God, I want my kids to be able to do this, and I just don't understand why my son can't run a 4240. I just don't understand it, God. Don't lie, Dad. Some of y'all have said that. And Judas betrays him with one of the most intimate meanings of a close friend, because in a Jewish custom, that's what, what men would do, and I know, here we are in the South, and us dudes are like, he huh, ain't kissing me on no cheek. We'd be fighting. I get it, but in other ethnic groups and other traditions, that's what they did. And it was a sign of endearment. The crazy, crazy depths that Judas went to. And Jesus even says to him in Luke's account, Judas, would you betray the son of man with a kiss? Can you imagine? Uh, the way the Greek is there, Judas did it long enough for them to be able to identify Jesus. Remember, there's no street lights. Uh, there's no light there. Uh, they probably would not have had a torch. It just kind of went under, under the nighttime. So it would have been super hard to recognize which one was Jesus. And, and Judas gives in, intricate instructions to this violent mob. And I'm just like, here's what we got to understand, folks. <laughs> Please don't underestimate the sin of which you're capable. Please don't get up on your high and mighty horse and point at someone else uh, that's messed up. And say, so I'd never do that. You, you, you're literally, you're a mistake waiting to happen. Uh, don't look at these people going down the street uh, that you can tell are struggling with addiction. And say, so I'd never be like that. Please. This dude orchestrated everything and he saw the God of the universe create thousands of meals out of nothing. He saw the compassion of Jesus. He would have seen him touch that woman with the, with the bleeding disorder. He would have seen it all. And I'm guaranteed there's probably some people here right now saying, man, how in the world did I get in this situation I'm in? Sin. Sin. And if there's some in here who think, well, I'm righteous and I would never do that, repent. Repent. Please don't underestimate the sin of which you're capable. Sin, I don't know who it's original with. I couldn't find it last uh, couple of days ago. I tried to find it, but sin will take you farther than you ever wanted to go. It will keep you longer than you ever wanted to stay, and it will cost you more than you ever wanted to pay. Please do not underestimate the amount of sin of which you are capable. We are all. I'm a heartbeat away from losing my marriage, my ministry, everything, because I have a sin nature. Please, folks, please get rid of the self-righteousness. God cannot stand it. He can't stand self-righteousness. We got to get rid of this. We love to blame Judas for anything. Folks, we're Judas. 
We are Judas. Sin compounds itself until a person is down a hole and they have no idea how they got down there. I see it time and time and time again. I'm like, man, I could be right there with them. And the only reason I'm not sitting in that chair and they're not sitting in this chair is the grace and sovereignty of God. And we all need to truly embrace that fact. And then you see what happened in verse 46. And they laid hands on him. That's a, a kind of a violent way. Like really, I mean, come here. And seized him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. We learn from John's account, it's Peter. Peter tries to make good on his valiant claim that he would die with him. When Jesus never asked him to. Jesus said, deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. Deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. But I want to do something social media share worthy. Oh, no, uh-uh, no, no, no. You know, it's, it's funny, you know, Peter wanted to die a valiant death that people would write about. And it reminded me when I was studying, we've got a couple of ladies up here who, who from time to time help lead worship. And they live about 45 minutes from here and they got a big family, both families. And they, and you know, it's all volunteer up here. And so they got to be here Wednesday night to help with worship practice. And they got to be here early Sunday. And here's the cool thing I get to see, because I know the context, y'all don't. But I get to see their husbands come in here about 15 minutes prior with all the kids. And man, they're flustered. And they're like, whew. And they're trying to get all these kids in here. They love their wives to let them do what they're called to do that's the kind of sacrifice Jesus was talking about. I am convinced. I'm convinced. Because here's the thing. Who's going to notice these dudes doing that? And I don't know how many of y'all got young kids. Man, they're hard. They're crazy. They're super hard. And these guys get these kids ready, and they come walking. And I'm like, but their wives get to enjoy doing what they're called of God to do. And God blesses that. He sees it. Who cares what everybody else sees? Peter was after the wrong thing. He's like, I'm going to go down in the blaze of glory. But that's not what Jesus wanted. Listen to what Jesus says in Luke's account. No more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Matthew's account. Jesus said to them, put your sword back into its place. For all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father? And he will at once send more than 12 legions of angels. That, by the way, is 72,000 angels. True disciples, do not advance or impose God's will on others through violence. We don't. Jesus never fought for his own personal rights and privileges. And there's a big, big, big teaching where I would probably get called a wimp for the way I teach. I do not get involved with politics. I teach the word of God to the best of my ability. And Jesus Christ is Lord. And sin is sin and hell is hot. And the only way to heaven is through the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ and him crucified. Period. We've got to get away from this fighting for our rights. Jesus is like, no, no, no. By the way, just say so you no. Know, you can read in 2 Kings 19 where one angel in one night killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. One angel, one night. And here's the thing, folks. I don't know exactly how the angels were viewing this. I know they were worshiping like crazy when he was born. But can you imagine the angels saying, Lord, Lord of hosts, please let us at those guys. We will wipe the entire human race off the face of the planet and we'll start over. Let me go. I bet their swords were drawn and they were ready to kill everybody. But God, oh, but God. He's like, I got a plan. I love these people. Jesus' next words affirms his humility and peace. And Jesus said to them, have you come out as against a robber? By the way, this Greek word here is more like a, a group of bandits uh, for an insurrection, sort of. Day after day, I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. Jesus stood there with majestic tranquility, with an amazing peace. And his words are, are something that settles the scene. And really what he does, he calls out their hypocrisy and, and honestly, their wimpiness. They come out at night under the, under the guardianship of nighttime, away from the crowds with a bunch of military so they don't have to do anything. And he's calling them out. 
But here's the other thing. I, I purposely let off the last part because this is what really calms it. And this is what goes all the way back to the Old Testament. He says, day after day, I was with you in the temple teaching you do not seize me, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. Wow. And what he's doing, he's going back to Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, Zechariah 12, where they clearly prophesied that the Messiah was going to suffer. Clearly. It's funny, Matthew's account, where Matthew's writing predominantly the Jewish Christians, he adds, let the scriptures of the prophets be fulfilled. Because Jesus is literally, again, the entire Old Testament must be read through the lens of what Jesus did at the cross of Calvary. Jesus fulfilled all of it. All of it. Praise his holy name. You know, there's, there's plaques on walls that say something to the effect of, if you have peace, when everybody else is in terror, maybe you don't understand the situation. And I, I, I can see how sometimes people could be aloof or just clueless. Jesus is the only one that had peace, and he could, he's the only one that fully understood the situation. Do you have peace in the middle of the storm? Do you have peace? Because the more you spend with God and crying out to him and sharing your raw thoughts, because he already knows. He already knows if you're mad at him. He already knows if you're questioning him. And you share that. Listen, he will start to heal you from that. Jesus, in the midst of the worst storm ever in human history, has an unshakable peace. And remember, at the Last Supper in John 14, literally this would have been a couple of hours prior, he says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. How many hearts in here are troubled right now? Folks, Jesus leaves his peace with us via Holy Spirit. It's, and then the tragic, horrible validation of his earlier prophecy. One of the saddest verses. And they all left him and fled. His closest friends live with him. I mean, I've got, I've got close friends and I can't imagine them saying, late, I'm out. I ain't gonna get anywhere around you. Good luck. I, I, I can't imagine. And it's not like I'm God. And it's not like I'm going to take on the sins of the world and take all of God's wrath. And by the way, the physical torture would have, he would have been looking forward to that either with his organs being shown through his torso after being flogged and the nails made out of the very alloy he created get driven through his body for us. It's not like he was laying, yay, I can't wait to have that happen. I mean, but everybody abandoned Jesus when he needed him most. Everybody did. He had not one solitary soul. And some theologians believe at this, time, at this point, and I, and I don't know, I could see why they would make the argument, but some theologians think at this point, God the Father went silent on him after this. Maybe he did. I, I don't know. We obviously know that Jesus cries out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So he's obviously not, he's, he can't talk next. He's, he's turning Jesus into sin. And then Mark puts a peculiar text in that's a big question mark. And a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body and they seized him, but he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. Now this is only in Mark's gospel and some people believe that this is John Mark himself. I have no idea, nor does anyone else. One of the most tragic things I saw in seminary was two of the smartest guys were in a, a violent argument over whether or not this was Mark. Now, are, you, are you kidding me right now? Here's the thing. Could it be in Mark? There are many theologians that believe this is John Mark. Here's the thing, though. That's speculation. What is Mark wanting us to glean from this text? How does it apply to our lives? Again, we love to get caught up in the question marks, don't we? How about the exclamation points? That's what we got to focus on. And so what's he trying to do? Well, here's the thing. Uh, you got to remember the beginning of the week, a ton of crowds were waving palm branches. Holy, holy, holy. And the same people were shouting, crucify him. But here's the thing. It's necessary to look at this Greek word, follow. There's a couple. Look at the one Mark chooses. To follow along, to obey, to be associated with. So whoever this person was, he was an associate of Jesus. Here's my question. During your work days, when you're in the break room, when you're out on a Friday night, are you this kind of a follower of Jesus? Can people tell you've been associated with him? 
This dude, they could. And here's the thing. He probably went out. I probably saw a commotion. He probably wrapped a linen sheet around him. By the way, it's a very high-end sheet. And one of the reasons people think it's Mark, because Mark's mother had a really nice house, and they think it might have been Mark because he could have afforded a nice linen sheet. Again, we don't know. But here's what we know. This person abandoned him too. Everybody did. Everybody. Everybody left him. And Jesus said, let the scriptures of the prophets be fulfilled. I think one fitting thing we can do is read just a glimpse of what Isaiah had to say about Jesus. Listen to this. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. That that Hebrew there is just heart-wrenching, crushing grief. And as from one whom we men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Wow. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God. We, they esteemed him as being punished by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed, praise his holy name. That's a spiritual healing, by the way. Don't take that verse out of context. Don't claim this verse and say something crazy is going to happen. We are redeemed. We are bought out of sin and slavery for eternity when we are sealed in the promised Holy Spirit in Christ Jesus. Praise his holy name. Then he says, so is there anyone that's not included in this word right here? I I, I may come across this way, and if I do, great. I don't like self-righteousness. I don't like it at all. We all struggle with it too, by the way. I do. You do. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. We all would have been shouting crucify him. We all would have been spitting on him. We would have driven the nails. And if you think you wouldn't have, you have a pride problem. God laid on him the iniquity of us all. All of us like sheep have gone astray. This was a horrible situation, but Jesus triumphantly and willingly puts one foot in front of the other. And we'll learn in a, in a couple of weeks how he gets tried and how he keeps his mouth shut. He doesn't say anything, and he is compelled by a submissive love uh, for the Father, a, a saving love for us, and a desire for him to get the glory, because that's what he gets out of this. And it's, it's incredible. How do we do it? Nathan, how do I do this? Well, I want to end with a couple of verses out of Hebrews 12 which gives us immense clarity in the how behind this. In Hebrews 12, 1, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every way and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance. Folks, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. The race that is set before us. Okay, Nathan, great. How? Listen to this. This is awesome. Tell us exactly how. What does that say underlined? One more time. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the, <laughs> for the joy, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God, the place of authority places, praise his holy name. And then listen, this, this Greek word looking, Look at the word that God chooses here. It means to keep thinking about without distraction, to develop more precise knowledge. Are you developing more precise knowledge of Jesus? Ryan, when he was teaching the men's group, he talked about for 13 years, he was a Christian, but he remained like a one-year-old Christian. How long have you been following Jesus? Are you maturing in your walk? Are you... Are you developing a more precise knowledge to direct one's attention without distraction? Folks, we got so many distractions. And then listen to the next verse. This is a wow. Consider him. Consider him. Everybody say, consider him. Okay, make sure following Jesus and considering him, you walk out here with that etched in your brain who endured from sinners such hostility against himself. So that, so that, you may not grow weary or faint-hearted in your struggle against sin. You have not yet resisted to the point 
of shedding your blood. It's necessary we look at this Greek word, consider. Check this out. To think about carefully and to reason thoroughly with careful deliberation. Do you Use careful deliberation when you consider what Jesus did. Folks, we got to get back to the scriptures. And here, here it is right here. Do I look to and consider Jesus the way scripture commands? That's the billion dollar question the Garden of Gethsemane teaches us. And the way Jesus handled it. Do, do, do I look to and do I consider Jesus the way scripture commands? Folks, <laughs> He went forth valiantly to meet his end. He received that terrible kiss of betrayal and he responded with love and peace. And there are people in here who've been been betrayed. I've been betrayed before. Betrayal is one of the hardest traumas to get over because it eats at your very soul. But none of us have been betrayed to the point that Jesus has. Not even close. He submitted to the arrest of the mob when he could have called down 72,000 angels and wiped the earth clean of all of us. And heaven would have been empty. He refused to exercise his natural strength. He depended upon the Father and his angels, and he did it all alone. And he was doing it because he spent time with the Father. Folks, we have got to look to and consider Jesus the way Scripture commands. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, God, I can't imagine... I can't imagine. I can't imagine Peter telling this uh, to Mark. God, I can't, I, can't, I can't imagine Jesus on his, on his face bleeding, knowing he's going to become the sin of the world after he's lived a perfect, sinless life, not one impure thought, not one ounce of bitterness, not one ounce of unforgiveness, not one ounce of unrighteous anger, no envy, no lust, no greed. No pride. And yet he takes it all from us. And God made him to be sin who knew no sin. So God, that when we're in Christ, we become your righteousness. God, if there's anyone here who does not realize there's God's kid, God, please have him fill out a care card. Let one of our elders talk to him. God, if there's someone that's been betrayed and they can't shake it, God, I've watched you move in so many countless lives through your word and your spirit. God, I just just thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for redeeming us. We were dead. We were dead. You made us alive with Christ. And God, he's coming back. And God's sin will have no more control. Death will be no more. Cancer will be no more. Addiction, nothing will have the last word. King Jesus is coming back. Praise your holy name, God. Please work in the lives of these people right now. God, we we thank you and we pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.